Today our topic brings us into the analysis of uh, urine. How important is this? Quite. With urine analysis, we'll take a look at a general examination. We'll take a, t- take a look at the various types of dipsticks. Yes, I said various types of dipsticks that are important for us to then measure whatever metabolite that we're looking for in the urine. Is that clear? Now understand that sometimes when you do a general dipstick, that you may or may not find the chemical that you're looking for based on the suspicion of the diagnosis that you're making for your patient. So how do you know which dipstick to use? The history. So all that you're doing in this section as we go through urine analysis and the different types of dipsticks, it is important that you understand, well, the history comes first, and then use this information that you're given for urine analysis as either confirmation or to complement and support the diagnosis that you've come up with. We'll take a look at the sediments and the various morphology of that that you find within the urine when we analyze. Now, each one of the terms that we then find in the urine, well, you've heard of casts before. You've heard of different types of cells, such as WBCs and RBCs. Well, all this becomes really important for us. But, as I said, at first, it's about the pathophysiology making sure that you have your foundation strong before you even take a look at the urine. Let's begin. Now, this table, there are a few tables that we'll be looking at in this lecture series, and uh, it would behoove you to spend a little bit of time and make sure that you understand each one of the uh, statements that I'll be making. So let me walk you through this. First component of urine on general examination that you will be conducting or you will be given in terms of information either from notes, from soap notes, or perhaps from your question, will then have you determine or, well, how did this occur in terms of color? If it's dark yellow, maybe concentrated urine, so therefore, tell me about your patient. Maybe perhaps dehydrated. Maybe there was excess sweating. And do you remember as to what happens in excess sweating? There's hypotonic loss of sodium, hypotonic loss of sodium. And so therefore, what's your plasma osmolarity? It's increased. Hmm. If your plasma os- osmolarity is increased, then uh, now you tell me, based on the lecture series at this point, these should be reflex answers, aren't they? If they're not, then maybe perhaps go back and lay down the foundation. When your plasma osmolarity is increased, then you'll have your osmoreceptors up in the hypothalamus releasing ADH. Woo! Down they come to the collecting duct. And what do they do? They then remove that fluid and water from your collecting duct, resulting in what kind of urine? Ah, concentrated urine. What color is this? Dark yellow. Let's move on. What if you found bilirubin? Completely different story, isn't it? Completely different story. In hepatobiliary pathology, we will have done, well, issues with jaundice. So therefore, we'll take a look at prehepatic, hepatic, post-hepatic jaundice, and what it means for you to actually find bilirubin in your urine. Now, there are different types in biochemistry. You have already discussed what bilirubin metabolism means and what type of bilirubin you should be finding in your urine versus that type of bilirubin which then indicates a pathology. So, for example, when you get the bilirubin down in the intestine, at some point you go through various mechanisms in which you finally form some of that urobilinogen. That urobilinogen will then contribute to the pigmentation of either your stool. Did you see your stool this morning? What color was it? That was brown. That's stercobilin. Or when you took urination or you went pee, then what color was your urine? Oh, it was yellow or golden. And that's a type of urobilin, isn't it? But ultimately, there are other components of bilirubin, such as conjugated bilirubin, and if that ends up in urine, that is a pathology. And that is something that we have discussed in hepatobiliary. And so therefore, the color of that urine here, in fact, would be dark, u- and dark yellow. Increased UBG would mean urobilinogen, and what that basically means is, say, for example, you're not able to properly, let me, let me ask you something. You ready? Now, if you get something into the intestine, is that then going to end up in your urine? Once again, if you get a substance in your intestine, this is just simple physiology, but this is where students go wrong. If you get something in your intestine, how in the world is that going to end up in your urine? If it ends up in your intestine, it ends up in your stool, I'll give you that. But in order for you to get something in your kidney, and this is important, then you have to reabsorb that substance from the intestine into the plasma, 
and then the plasma goes to the kidney, and then it gets filtered. Only then will it end up in your urine, right? So whenever you find increased urobilinogen, it only means that there's ex- excess amounts of this in your blood or in your plasma. It is only then that it gets filtered. So maybe perhaps there was a blockage. Blockage of what? Mm, maybe there was some kind of hepatic obstruction. And if there's some type of biliary obstruction, then the only method out from your liver would be into the plasma. Keep that in mind. Now, so this is just one statement in which there was all this understanding that took place prior to you actually examining and analyzing urine for your bilinogen. What about vitamins? Well, as far as vitamins are concerned, what kind of uh, substance or what kind of characteristic does a vitamin have to have for it to be in your urine? It has to be conjugated. It has to be water-soluble, doesn't it? And so that then becomes important in terms of, let's say that you take vitamin C or vitamin B vitamins. Some of those are water-soluble. Could they then end up in your urine? Quite a, quite a bit, actually. So all those vitamins that you end up taking, remember, a lot of those, if you don't require it, they end up in your urine, gets reabsorbed into your plasma, and then it gets filtered. Dark, dark yellow color, number one. A second type of color, red or pink, what's this mean? The urine actually looks red. For example, you wake up in the morning and uh, that first micturition, that first micturition, passing of urine, oh my God, it's red. How did that happen? It's kind of scary for the patient, isn't it? How How in the world did you end up getting blood in your urine? Well, that one that I just gave you where you wake up in the morning, well, what happened at night perhaps? Your respiratory rate, Increased or decreased? Let me walk you through this. Decreased respiratory rate, huh? Mm. You're holding on to carbon dioxide. So for that moment at night, then what is your pH? A little bit decreased, it's called respiratory acidosis. So at night, you go through respiratory acidosis, and then all of a sudden, the RBCs are undergoing severe intravascular hemolysis. So all of this comes into simple pathophysiology, well, not so much simple, but you're strong the time that you spent understanding a condition called proxismal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. In proxismal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, the problem is genetically in which the complement system ends up destroying your RBCs intravascularly in conditions that are acidotic. Welcome to nocturnal at night. You wake up in the morning, what do you find your urine to be? Well, that's the patient That's a patient himself or herself that ends up seeing red urine. Hematuria is what this is. Then we have hemoglobinuria. What does that mean to you? Well, this is something like intravascular hemolysis, in which you are literally losing hemoglobin through your glomerulus. And this is an example that I gave you, such as PNH, proxismal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. All I'm doing you all I'm doing at this point is giving you a little bit of history based on some of the findings that you have uh, based on the color of your urine. What if it was myoglobinuria? How do you think about this? Or how should you be thinking about this? Myoglobin is the hemoglobin for the muscle, hence myo, right? And so therefore, say that you get into a crush injury. And if there's a crush injury, literally, there's damage to the skeletal muscle in which you are then releasing myoglobin into the urine, or excuse me, into the plasma. And that then ends up in the urine. What do we call this? Myoglobinuria. What color might this then give you urine, red or pink? Drugs such as phenazepiridine or urinary anesthetics possibility. And then porphyrias. The big one here, you might have heard of acute intermittent porphyria. Acute intermittent porphyria. It's a porphyria in which many of the symptoms and signs that you find with AIP would begin with the letter P. Meaning to say that you would end up having pink urine. There would be abdominal pain. There is P psychosis. Okay, at least take three P's right now for acute intermittent porphyria, one of them being pink urine. Do you see the significance of urine analysis thus far? You thought that you can just go through this and memorize that? You know me well enough where that's not what we're going to do. It's about you looking at this, seeing this, hearing this, and truly coming up with a few differentials in your head as to, well, what's going on with your patient? Let's continue. What if it was smoky colored urine? Acid pH Urine converts the hemoglobin into what's called hematin. It's a common finding in nephritic. Okay? And if you're dealing with nephritic, you should be thinking something along the lines of perhaps IgA nephropathy. Why did I say IgA nephropathy? Because that would be the most common type of glomerulonephritis. 
So nephritic, what does that mean to you? You pay attention to letter H and a lecture series that we have together in which we talk about glomerulonephritides and we talk about nephritic syndrome. I will have you highlight in your head the letter H for nephritic. Why? That H means hypertension, hematuria. It could mean that you have smoky colored urine. Hematin is what you're paying attention to. What if it was black urine? That's crazy, isn't it? Could you imagine urinating, urinating and then upon exposure to oxygen in the environment, it turns black? What's your diagnosis? Well, this would be something like alkaptonuria, autosomal recessive disorder with a deficiency. And you must memorize, and you have memorized in biochemistry, the enzyme called homogenticate oxidase. So homogenticate oxidase is the enzyme that's deficient in a condition called alkaptonuria. Now, that that you find as being black is what happens. Take a look. It's a homogenticic acid in the urine, and therefore, upon exposure to light, as soon as it comes out into the world, the urine does, it then turns black. And some of this black substance may also accumulate within your cartilage and such, called ochronosis. Continue. We'll talk about clarity. So one major component that we just completed our discussion is color. What about clarity? What if it was cloudy urine? This is alkaline pH. So what does this mean to you? Normal finding, most often due to phosphates. Cloudy. What if it was cloudy urine with acid pH? Normal finding, most often due to uric acid. So you want to be familiar as to what the pH of a urine is in great detail. In general, it tends to be on the acidic side. But if it's a little bit more acidic, say that it's below 4, and then you start thinking about uric acid. If it's on the higher side, maybe 5.5 and maybe 6, then you're thinking along the lines of phosphate, depending as to what the physiologic needs of the patient is. Then you have others. Others in terms of clarity, you have bacteria, WBCs. We will, we will be focusing upon these as we progress further through urine analysis. Do you see now as to how we've created a picture of a table? And the more number of times that you're able to give a clinical tags, and, when I, and let, me, let me give you a, a tidbit of advice here. It is not imperative at this point for you to go through every single detail and don't get frustrated that you're not, if you're not able to come up with the differential immediately. At least pick one or two components of each one of these characteristics. If it's dark yellow, for at this point, if all that you can remember is bilirubin, okay, that's fantastic, it's okay. At least you give yourself one tag of a differential, right? If the only thing that you can, uh, at this point, remember with pink as being, oh, something like myoglobinuria, that's okay. And you keep coming back, you keep coming back. Every time you come back, you give a clinical tag. You give a clinical correlation with each one of these findings. And before you know it, you have a whole host of differentials. You do that throughout medicine with me, and you will be in fantastic shape, shape when it comes to pathology. Another component will be specific gravity. What's this mean? Literally, the gravity that the urine is exhibiting. Evaluate urine concentration and dilution. Now, before we move on, if your urine is concentrated, what color is it? Dark yellow. Next, if your urine is concentrated, what do you expect the gravity to be? Use common sense here. Obviously, it'll be increased. Let's take a look. If your specific gravity is above, now this you want to memorize, 1.023. The usual limit of specific gravity is usually about 1010. And what I mean by that is 1.0, 1.0. Use 1010. 1.0, 10. How would you say that in layman terms? Say 1010. 10. Make your life easier. Now, here we have something that's greater than 1.023. That's high specific gravity. Next, well, okay, that sounds good, but what does that actually mean? Because you're responsible to do what? You're responsible to actually interpret labs in your hands, maybe on a computer screen, what have you. And you should be able to take a look at urine osmolarity. Take a look at what's in the parentheses here. Urine osmolarity at 900 milliosmoles. Let me ask you something. What's normal plasma osmolarity? Normal, approximately. 300. When you get this plasma into the Bowman space, and the proximal portion of your PCT, what's your urine osmolarity approximately? 300. Ah, what's my point? <laughs> if you start moving down the descending limb, you start raising urine osmolarity, doesn't 900 seem a lot more dramatically increased than 300? It is. Is 900 concentrated or diluted urine, please? 
it's concentrated urine. What's your specific gravity? Higher. Understand the concept first, then you put in the values. Indicates urine concentration and excludes intrinsic renal disease. Excludes it. Why? That means that ADH has had, had an opportunity to remove the water and thus increase concentration. Let's continue. So we have hypotonic urine. Has a specific gravity of 1.015. What does this mean? Don't memorize this either. Understand the concept first. Hypotonic urine. What kind of urine is this? It's diluted urine. Did ADH work yet? Hmm, probably not because you created diluted urine. So urine osmolarity, take a look at this. What's normal plasma osmolarity? Plasma osmolarity, approximately 300. And then you get it into the Bowman space. What is the urine osmolarity there? Approximately 300. Take a look at the urine osmolarity in the parentheses. What does that say? 220 in the urine. What does that mean to you? Hypotonic urine. What do you call that in layman terms? Diluting urine. What is the specific gravity? Decreased. Understand the concept. Then you memorize less than 1.0. One five. Let's move on. Urine osmolarity is the best indicator of urine concentration or dilution. We just went through examples here of showcasing that. Next, what if it was a fixed specific gravity? Okay, so then we have here, let's say that it's fixed at approximately normal, and we'll use 1010. 1.010, 1010. Correlation with urine osmolarity, lack of concentration and dilution. Mm, this indicates chronic renal failure. I want you to come back up and take a look at the second row here and where we talked about specific gravity being greater than 1.023. That is concentrated urine. What does that do? That excludes intrinsic renal disease. But if your urine osmolarity is fixed throughout the nephron, do you understand the concept? Nothing is changing. Why? Because the kidney is dying. Do you understand how important this is? Example, chronic renal failure. How important is this? Ridiculously important. How often does this occur? You ever heard of diabetic nephropathy? It occurs more often than one would think, huh? Specific gravity. Spend a little bit of time here, understand the concepts, and put in the values. 